much since the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And in aggregate, uh, again, they, they do, in my opinion, provide proof of reincarnation. But over the years, as I was uh, doing the research, people would propose cases to me, and I didn't know how to evaluate them. So um, I started to work with different psychics to see if anybody seemed to have the ability to make accurate past life matches. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, nobody that I, I met seemed to be able to do that until I met Kevin. And Kevin channels a spirit guide named Atun Ray, mm -hmm. who uh, demonstrated to me that he could make these matches and they appeared to be accurate to me. And the difference is that he could give me past lifetimes of individuals that were very obscure, right. where I had to really search to try to find this person in history. And, uh, but when I did, everything matched, the same face, same personality, and it just seemed to be way beyond coincidence. And he had um, an encyclopedic scope of knowledge. Right. And uh, I've worked with Kevin and Atun Ray for 11 years now, a long time. And I have sessions uh, monthly, more than one session monthly. And so uh, I can honestly say that two of my best friends now are one, Kevin Ryerson, and Atun Ray, who's a spirit <laughs> being. And, and uh, you know, I'm a pr I am a doctor, I'm a pretty skeptical person. And, uh, you know, over the years I've just seen that Atun Ray's fund of knowledge is just far beyond what's possible for Kevin or, or really hardly any human being I've met. And, and he's very wise and compassionate and it's been quite a journey. So the, the, the second book, The Origin of the Soul and Purpose of Reincarnation, is actually based on my dialogues with Atun Ray. And so, you know, the, here's a, a spirit being who I can have, uh, Kevin is a trance channel, right. which means that when Atun Ray comes through, uh, Kevin actually leaves his body. Mm -hmm. and. Um, when Atun Ray comes in, his, uh, the voice changes, it's much deeper, he mm -hmm. speaks with an Egyptian accent, uh, he has a totally different sense of humor, a very good sense of humor, but very different than Kevin's. So, you know, it's, it's a transformation where the person sitting in front of me is no longer Kevin. You know, it's, it's the same body, but the facial expressions are different, uh, the voice is different, the personality is different. So I realized I have this opportunity to have dialogues just like you and I are having with a spirit being, you know, who says he last incarnated about 3,500 years ago. And he would be considered a, a ascended master or, or somebody right. like that. I would like to uh, share another case of reincarnation with you. Uh, the case of um, Robert Snow. Homicide for the Indianapolis police, Robert Snow's motto was just the facts. So when it came to a concept like reincarnation, Captain Snow filed it away under silly ideas without a shred of evidence. But when evidence of his own past life started piling up, Robert Snow began to change his mind. After more than 30 years of crime scenes and murder investigations, Captain Robert Snow wasn't phased by anything. So what made this hardened cop shake with terror at the grave of an obscure painter who died in 1917? I used to have this thing when I was a rookie, my left knee would always shake. Whenever I get scared, my left knee would shake. And I found that if I got to the grave, I couldn't stop it. No matter what I did, I couldn't stop it. It had all started at a Christmas party. Captain Snow and his wife, who was also a detective, were talking with a police psychologist who used past life regression in her patient's therapy. And I kind of, kind of made fun of it. I said, if past lives are true, why had never been anyone ever proved it? Why had anyone ever proved it in past life? And she recommended that maybe he should go through the, the uh, regression and see what he thought of it. And at first I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Then I got down to the point, gee, are you scared? 
and you don't want to ask a man or a police officer, particularly if you're scared. Of course you're not scared. And I'm not going to do it. The woman gave Captain Snow the name of Dr. Mary Ellen Griffith. Snow went to her office with a tape recorder and a skeptical attitude. Dr. Griffith was skeptical of his motives, too. When most people come in out of curiosity, most of the time it's whether to prove or disprove it. And so I just had this um, assumption or maybe intuition that he was here to disprove it. But when Dr. Griffith put him under hypnosis, Captain Snow began seeing strange events he couldn't explain. I think I was as surprised as he was. He had probably had more specific details than anyone that I've addressed. I'm on the street, but it's not, it's not from the day, it's from the 19th century, because I can see horses pulling, pulling carriages, I can see gas lights. I see this woman, and we go to an outdoor cafe. I order a glass of wine, and she orders some kind of special water. And we, this is my wife now, and we were arguing, we were arguing about money. And so I get angry and I just walk in to my studio. And suddenly I realize this is where I work. I could just visualize um, where he was and what he was doing. She says, you, you work in the studio, so you're a painter? And suddenly I knew, I said, yeah, I'm a painter. I'm in the studio and I'm painting a portrait. The, the woman I'm painting is a hunchback. And so I thought it was kind of odd. I thought it was really odd painting a hunchback woman. For almost half an hour, Dr. Griffith guided Captain Snow through his mysterious visions. The detective saw detail after detail of the artist's life. I said, we should have had children. My wife and I didn't have children because my wife couldn't have children. And I kept saying over and over to Dr. Griffith, I'm painting portraits, but I hate painting portraits. I hate painting portraits, but I need the money. So I really need the money, but I hate doing this. Then, towards the end of the session, the visions became more intense. I said, she died of a blood clot. They say she died of a blood clot. I said that three or four times. And then before the next scene came up, the recorder I brought, brought along snapped off and opened my eyes. And it was over. That was the end. But it wasn't the end. I think about it all the time. I think about it 20 times a day. If I closed my eyes, I could still see the mission vividly clear. But Snow refused to believe that these were memories from a past life. The police detective clung to his lifelong skepticism. He had to prove that everything he had seen under hypnosis had a perfectly logical explanation. My whole idea was to find proof that this was all subconscious memories from this life. That I had seen the painting somewhere before in an art exhibition, in an art book, a history book somewhere. Captain Snow didn't know anything about art, but he knew how to solve a mystery by investigating every possible clue. I said I would do it. I'd go to the public library go through their art book collection and thumb through it till I found the portrait. It took me several months, and I went through every single one and didn't find Visit every art gallery in Indianapolis, talked to all the art gallery owners, didn't find anything. Melanie Snow partnered her husband in the investigation, but without success. We would go to different stores, the bookstores and whatever, and look through uh, books to see if we could locate that picture, and we didn't have any luck. The investigators got a break when they least expected it, on vacation in New Orleans. We were walking through the French Quarter, and there's a lot of antique stores in that area and art galleries. But when we went into one particular art gallery, that's when Bob found the painting. There's a portrait sitting on the easel. It's, I'm, I'm stunned. I stop. Suddenly, it's the picture of the hunchback woman. Well, I closed my eyes, and I could see myself in the, in the studio again. I could see the painting, and I could see myself painting. I could see every single brushstroke. I opened my eyes, and there it was. The portrait was by a little-known artist named James Carroll Beckwith. Snow had never heard of him. After Beckwith died in 1917, his work was all but forgotten. I said, so I asked the artist, I said, uh, I've seen this painting somewhere before. I said, has this been in a museum or an exhibition somewhere? So I, I know I've seen this before. It's just, he said, no, you never see it before. This has been in a private collection for years. But if Beckwith's painting had been in a private collection, how could Captain Snow have known about it? Unless he had been Beckwith in a past life. Things like this happen on the X-Files. They happen in movies. Things like this don't happen in real life. Then, 
Snow discovered there were copies of Beckwith's diaries at the Smithsonian Institution. About 15,000 pages. Now, Snow was certain the details he had seen under hypnosis would be flatly contradicted by Beckwith's own words. I wanted to find one, th one or two things that I had said to your question that couldn't be true. Dates, places, cause of death. You know, he wants to look at all the facts before he makes a decision, and that's very important in police work. Captain Snow dug into the diaries. Every date, place, and cause of death confirmed his visions instead of disproving them. I kept finding one little piece after another that was true. The date of death, he didn't have children because his wife couldn't have children, that he drank wine, that he didn't like painting portraits, that he needed money. All those things, each one was little. Each one was a little, one more little thing to it. And the bad part was he kept confirming all the stuff that he's believing that he's Carol Beckwith. And I'm not comfortable with my husband being a reincarnated painter. But probably one of the biggest thing I'm looking for is when I got to December 5th, 1886, and found a notation that his mother was in church and died of a blood clot. When I read the entry about his mother, that was probably the moment I decided this, this, and this was the life I had lived. I, have, I don't think I've ever had a murder case where I have this much evidence. Captain Snow had convinced himself, but could he convince anybody else? I just felt like uh, it wouldn't be received well within the police department and with family, or friends. I still sat on this for several years. I was really reluctant to go public at this. It's not something police captains talk about. And I had, it took me a long time before I could actually come forward with it. But finally, Captain Snow started sharing his story with others. After all, he was sure of his facts. I, I must admit I've been stunned. The reaction to people have been much, much better than I thought. Case closed, except for one final act. Captain Snow felt he had to make a pilgrimage to New York State. He visited the grave that holds Carol Beckwith's body. A body Snow says was his from 1852 to 1917. My heart was just beating, just pounding my chest. I, could I was sweating. I've had people tell me you were re-experiencing his death. Did Captain Snow re-experience the painter's death and life? He says he's proven that past lives are real. I'm a cop. My job is investigation. People want to believe it, that's fine. If they don't want to believe it, that's fine. But to me, what this proves is that I carry the Carol Beckwith memories in my mind. And I obviously was Carol Beckwith. Other psychologists and psychiatrists um, who um, have several, had several cases of their own, and they believe that past life memories are real. Dr. Morris Netherton, Andy Tomlinson, Dr. Roger Wolger. Past life therapy is a therapeutic process which uses reincarnation or past life experience as the source for, for the therapy. Sometimes I come early and, and run private sessions, sometimes my associates, Reincarnation has been taught now for over 4,000 years. And all I've done is just expand it into a therapeutic process, which is, it really works. But I've been doing this for 50 years. Not every past life, you're not going to find every past life, because they're not all activated as, as part of your patterns in this life. Trauma in a past life continues to influence you in this life because there was something back there when it happened that did not allow you to resolve it. It's unfinished. The first is near-death experiences where the person is able to see and experience the events around them even when the heart has stopped and there's no brain activity. The second is in the past lives of children, these are spontaneous past lives, and the third is uh, past lives that adults can experience. It was only when I discovered a colleague who knew a bit about hypnotic regression that we both agreed to try a technique with each other out of a book, and back came the same lifetime, and then I had to look at it in some detail. This colleague was a psychotherapist, and uh, we became struck as we ran each other's stories uh, by the emotional power of the stories. 
And after about a year of experimenting with each other, and we, we tried the technique on a few colleagues, and for a while had a small group of six of us. We were exchanging sessions. And after a year or so, we decided that we might be able to use this with clients. And shortly after that, we tried it with a few clients very successfully. And I also started teaching workshops around that time, which is where I got a sense of the variety of stories that can come up when people are regressed, and how different everyone's emotional and physical style is, that there is not one way to regress someone. There are as many ways to regress someone as there are people, as far as I can see. Past life therapy is generally viewed with deep suspicion by mainstream psychology in America, uh, but it, we're in very good company because parapsychology is viewed with deep suspicion by the American Psychological Association, and so is transpersonal psychology. Uh, so we be belong to the, the outsider uh, contingent of, I would say, experimental psychology that is looking to the spiritual fringes of things. Those who experience it uh, are aware that it's a much faster and often more effective cure than many traditional uh, methods. And I think public demand is going to bring it more into the forefront. Very often when a client comes in with a complaint, the most obvious example would be a phobia, an irrational fear. And it is irrational. The person is afraid of cats. The person is afraid of going out into the supermarket. The person is afraid of crossing the street that they might get run down. And in each of these cases, in the interview, we first of all find out whether indeed they have been savaged by a cat, whether they have been run over by a car, or whether they were raped or something in a supermarket. And usually we find nothing happened. They have no history in this lifetime of dire events happening in that way. This is why the phobia is irrational. It doesn't make sense. It's the unfinished lives which seem to be passed on to future lifetimes. I can't prove that every single regression has a lifetime that I can show historically happened because many of them are outside historical periods. We had a, a lady in a workshop who remembered uh, very clearly the life of a, of a painter at the time of the Renaissance in Italy. It was extremely detailed and sounded quite authentic. And she got the town, it was Siena, and she got a name, which I don't remember at this point. But it was an uh, Italian-sounding name. No one had heard of it in the workshop. And it seemed to be rather a, a minor painter. So she went to her local library in uh, Berkeley, California, and looked up the painter, and couldn't find any name, anything corresponding to that name. So then she went to the university library and tried the art department there. Still couldn't find the name. At that point, she was ready to give up and think she must have, thought she must have made the whole thing up. And a friend said, have you tried the Courtauld Art Institute or someplace like that? Uh, somewhere else, San Francisco, or I'm not quite sure where. Uh, anyway, she did research at a major art institute, and in a big five-volume history of Italian art, she found the name. And then she got quite excited. And so she uh, booked a holiday to Italy. She'd never been to Italy before. She got on the plane, arrived in somewhere, Milan, took a, a car to Siena, and uh, when she got out of the car in the central square, she said, I know exactly where we are, and started walking around the town without any kind of a map. And she said, this is where it is. And she led her husband down a little street. And at the bottom of the street, in a, in a medieval house that's still standing in Siena, mostly medieval houses, there was a plaque on the wall with that painter had been honored by the Italian tourist agency. Never been to Italy in her life. The list of psychologists and psychiatrists who believe that past life regressions or past life memories are real does not end here. There is, a, there is an International Association for Regression Research and Therapies, IARRT, that has more than 200 
members. Each of these psych psychiatrists and psychologists are actively practicing past life regression techniques with their clients. The web their website is iarrt.org and there are several psychiatrists in, in each of the states of the United States and other countries of the world. At least each of the states like Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Ohio, other states have several psychiatrists who are actively practicing these techniques with clients. Um, so the number of psychiatrists are not limited to few outlier psychiatrists who believe that these memories are real. Uh, I think uh, let's move on. Um, The last prominent researcher in uh, past life research is Dr. Ian Stevenson, former professor of psychiatry at the University of Virginia. Now since Ian Stevenson um, did the majority of his research between 1960s and 1990s, nearly 30 to 50 years ago, I couldn't find a comprehensive um, or a complete video or interview online so I can, so that the video can uh, show his extensive work. So I decided to uh, present his work myself, briefly myself. Dr. Stevenson was chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Virginia in uh, School of Medicine in the 1960s. The cases of xenoglossy in uh, past reincarnation cases keep coming to the department and they were investigating these cases sporadically the best they could. Gradually, the number of reported cases were so large that, and they seemed convincingly solid, that eventually Ian Stevenson stepped down as chairman of the Department of Psychiatry in 1967 to investigate these cases full time. Xenoglossy, or xenoglossy, uh, as we said, is an ability to speak a language the subject has never learned. We have basically different types of xenoglossy. It might be a recitative xenoglossy, a writing xenoglossy, or um, responsive xenoglossy, which is the most strong, which is the strongest version of xenoglossy. The reciting xenoglossy, for example, um, is just it's still a, a normal phenomenon, but reciting xenoglossy means that a person just might suddenly start to speak a different language he or she has never learned, such as German or French under hypnosis, um, such as cases that you, you, um, you uh, observed um, in the first part. It is still a paranormal phenomenon. However, skeptics have said that reciting xenoglossy might not be accounted as an evidence for um, a past life evidence because the person might have heard this statement or the part of the statement or part of the sentence um, in previous years in a movie or a TV program and just under hypnosis just recites the sentence and there is no paranormal aspect to this and they might be right that's why we want to focus on responsive xenoglossy which is the strongest form of xenoglossy in which the subject can carry on a conversation in that language. They can hear the question, can understand the meaning of the question, and respond meaningfully to the question. So it is not possible to do this kind of xenoglossy by memorizing, or by memorization, because the subject are not aware of what is being asked. The cases I'm going to present is all in responsive xenoglossy category. The first case I want to talk about, the Ian Stevenson document of will, is Jensen case. The initial investigation and the session that started in 1956, which was basically a case of an American woman who remembered a previous life under hypnosis as a Swedish farmer in 16th century. 
the person has never learned Swedish and is, she has never been exposed to Swedish or has any Swedish friends but under hypnosis she could understood the question and respond meaningfully to the question questions in Swedish as you might have guessed in xenoglossy cases one important aspect of investigation is to rule out fraud Stevenson spent a few years and did a thorough research to investigate if subject had the opportunity to learn Swedish language. He investigated this by interviewing and collecting testimonies of their friends, their relatives, and co-workers, neighbors, former and current teachers, etc. I would say you should read the whole investigation yourself. It is a very thorough investigation and I will uh, show you the reference shortly but it is in my opinion worth reading St Stevenson even investigated the honesty of the subject in the local community and found indeed that she and her family her and her family were very respected and honest people even the main skeptic of Stevenson's work Sarah Thomason says that Stevenson's effort to rule out fraud are convincing. Stevenson documented basically 160 pages of responsive xenoglossy with this subject. Here are excerpts of these 160 pages. What you see in the screen is the transcript of the interview in Swedish on left and the translation in English for our understanding on the right side of the screen. I draw your attention to the fact that the translation was not happening in the session. The interlocutor, interpreter was just talking to the subject in Swedish and, and subject responded back in Swedish. The subject has never learned Swedish before in, in her life. The interlocutor asked the question in Swedish which the meaning of the, the translation of this question is where do you live and the subject answers meaningfully understands the question and answers meaningfully in the house again the, the interlocutor asks where is the house located in Swedish and the subject answers meaningfully in Swedish again in Hansen which is the name of the place in the area that she said she was living so the subject understands the question and responds meaningfully this was the page 104 of this manuscript. This is another excerpt, another example, page 111. The interlocutor asking Swedish again, um, what do you have to give me? And, and the subject answers in Swedish, the grain. Because the subject has mentioned that in a, in a few lines before this page that she has been, he has been a farmer, he has been a male in the previous life, he has been a farmer and so he answers the question correct, um, correctly and meaningfully. I want to also draw, to the, draw your attention to the fact that in several cases, more than 60 to 70 occasions, the word that the subject uses has not been offered by interlocutor. Some of the skeptics have argued that some of the words that the subject has used first has been mentioned by interlocutor but this, this is one of those examples and there are 60 more 60 different places that the subject has not picked the word from the interlocutor or from the, the word is basically new and has not been used in session or previous session with the subject so it shows that the subject have a good grasp on the language and um, can um, it does not pick up just words from the interlocutors. Here's another excerpt of this case, uh, which shows that the subject understands the question and answers meaningfully. The, the interlocutor asks, what do you kill with a spear? And the subject answers meaningfully, and so this again, an animal. The Stevenson documented this case in detail um, and published a detailed report of this in 1974 in a book entitled Xenoglossy, a Review and Report of a Case. Now let me quickly open a 
short discussion section here about the skeptics' point of view because that's important. Main skeptics of Stevenson's work are not psychiatrists. Basically, they are linguists, not psychiatrists. Some skeptics, like Thomason, for example, that have read Stevenson's work um, and have written a review on that, say that the subject only produced around 100 Swedish words. Well, I draw your attention to the fact that linguists such as Sarah Thomason, Sarah Thomason are just linguists and they are not familiar or knowledgeable in psychology and or hypnosis. They have never had any cases of hypnosis or any client to put them under hypnosis and they are not hypnotists basically or um, hypnotherapists. Everyone who has worked with the subject under deep hypnosis knows that when the subject is under deep hypnosis, they are in a very relaxed and calm state. They are very um, close to sleepy mode or dr they um, look very drowsy, drowsy or they don't talk in long sentences or long and elaborate sentences. They, have, they use short sentences or a couple of words and you have to ask question. They don't volunteer information because they they probably want to stay in that state of calm and, and uh, quietness. I just wanted to say that the skeptics just analyze from linguistics point of view because they are not psychiatrists. And Thomason, as I said, for example, say why only 100 words? Well, in, in this state that I described, how many words does anyone produce in a simple interview with, uh, when eliminating the repeating words? Some critics, other, some other critics, or even Thomason says that if some of them were used by interlocutor before the subject uses them, but it was still, we eliminate those, still subject produced around 60 Swedish words. Moreover, in my opinion, if you don't know a word, it is almost impossible to repeat it right after you hear it in a sentence, the first time in a sentence among all other words without asking a speaker to repeat it a couple of times. I think we are all familiar with this effect and have asked multiple times the speaker to repeat the word that we were not familiar with. Anyway, if we, in my opinion, we should consider just the, the whole 100 words as an evidence. But even if we want to be super critical and we want to assume that the subject is a linguist genius and picks up the word the first time she hears it among the other words still we have 60 words the subject produced and we have no explanations for nobody has mentioned those 60 words before anyway in any case 100 or 60 let's not talk about numbers it is still responsive to numbers and a, a couple of other points I want to make before move, moving on. When we say subject produce 60 or 100 words, it could be a little misleading for the audience. Um, subject produced or spoke 60 or 100 words. But for understanding the questions, she had to know several hundred words to be able to produce those 60 words and to be able to answer that question meaningfully and correctly. So his vocabulary cannot be only 60 or 100 words because he cannot answer the questions. And contrary to some other skeptics belief that they thought that well 60 or 100 words or even in a larger number is possible to learn it from a dic dictionary, I would just say that knowing these words by just memorizing or learning